Uh, but the reason I really want to talk about uh, growth hacking uh, from the bigger per perspective on the bigger picture is simply because it's a very topical subject. A lot of people are so interested in it, a lot of people are discussing about it, but there is a lot of misconceptions about uh, what exactly is it and how it's practiced. So I really want to give like, a, a bigger talk about what is it that we do every day. Um, usually when I have to talk about myself, I have to put a disclaimer. Uh, I come from games. I used to work in a company called Digital Chocolate where we made uh, mobile free-to-play games. So a lot of my understanding about growth comes from free-to-play mobile uh, model. So, so if that is kind of worrying you, you know, uh, I, I can assure you that it, it shouldn't really uh, because there are a lot of takeaways. And in fact, uh, studying it and working with it made me realize how much can actually cross-pollinate uh, into all kinds of commercial mobile apps and that's where I'm working right now. Right now I'm, I'm uh, doing product management for the mobile apps at uh, Vivino and in case you don't know what Vivino, you're probably one of the very few people in Denmark so please download the Sosam Wise, we can show you later how it all works. So. Uh, what I really want to talk about is about these three subjects and the reason is that very often this kind of uh, misconceptions about growth happening can be summarized in three questions. What exactly is it that you do? Like when you go to work, what do you do every day? And you know, once this is kind of understood, then the next question is usually, oh yeah, I heard about this growth hacking thing and, and Twitter. Can you please tell me how I'm going to grow my whatever metric like by 400 percent in two years right and when you explain that and usually it's like yeah but what, what is the big picture can you tell me the formula like the, the secret sauce behind growth um and, and, and of course there isn't really one but i, I will try to explain uh, through these points uh, why actually there isn't one so i want to talk about the uh, the value of understanding versus the value of knowing uh and also thoughts based on complexity and finally uh, the the importance of communicating growth and growth strategies so this is why we exist, growth hackers. I, I'm going to quote here uh, Donald, who actually proved a very good point. Uh, he said, there are too many things, especially the very important things we don't know, we don't know. There are too many unknowns, unknowns. And, 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 and that's basically, I think, uh, why, why growth hacking uh, came about in the first place. So, so you're probably here. Growth hackers are usually in this situation where we have now euphemistically called uh, market fit products, right? You have you have a product, you build it, you have some users or some customers, they land on your page, maybe some of them use it, maybe even some of them like it, maybe even fewer of them get to pay for it, uh, and then some even fewer get to recommend to some friends. But the truth is that you know you really don't have a very good understanding of what's going on with your product. You have what I usually call this uh, archetypical uh, anecdotal knowledge. You have like a you know, high mission statements about, you know, we want to solve problem X for these people, or we are uh, whatever company but for dogs, uh, and so on and so on. But, but there is really like a, this kind of knowledge about uh, what, what we are and what we do, but there is not enough understanding about how actually users use your product or why they use it in the first place. And, and for me, that's, that's basically my, my, my everyday. And my main goal as a growth hacker is to understand core product value and user behavior. Every day I go to work, the first thing I think is, how am I gonna understand core product value and, and, and user behavior today? What, what am I gonna learn? And of course, the first question that comes into mind is like, what, what about testing, right? Like growth hacking is all about experiments and testing, and, and, and that's all fine. Uh, and and I, I, of course, testing is, the most valuable tool uh, in, in the school set of, of a growth hacker. And I, and I shouldn't validate that, but uh, you, we're not there to do A-B tests. You're not a growth hacker simply because you can you know, make a hypothesis test and produce some results. You, you, the, the, when it boils down to a core point, is all about understanding user behavior and core product value. It's not just running a test. And in fact, the more I work with it, the more skeptical I become of this for two reasons. As most of you that probably run some tests, you can't test everything. So knowing or understanding better what tests you need to run is more important than actually executing tests after test after test. Uh, and the second one is that you have to be aware how you use testing because it can also be used as a weapon of knowing against understanding. And there was in a previous company that I worked that actually we had many cases where people with a lot of this archetypical arcane knowledge about how things should work would tell you, no, this is how we should do it and this is how things are done because I know it. I know my shit, I know exactly how it should be done. And if you don't believe me, you know, you can always test it later. And, and that's always good to test and disprove all this lore. Uh, but, you know, being <coughs> in startups, it's, it's kind of like a, 
uh, mundane to try to disprove everything. You know, you have to work uh, as a unit. So when I talk about understanding, for me, it's like these three very, very basic things. Where are your users coming from, how, and why? And it's usually summarized by the broad title of user acquisition, but it's really, you have to understand where are they coming from to your product, why are they coming from, and where exactly is it, that, and how, how do they end up uh, at your product. So, and the second thing, which I, I would argue like it's the most, most important one is, do you actually uh, serve core product value to your customers within the first minute? If you don't, I would urge, Go back, you know, forget about all the testing, forget about everything else. Everything you should be focusing on is this, especially when it comes to mobile. If, the, if there's something I've learned working with it so for quite a few years is that if you cannot deliver core product value in the very first session, in the very few seconds, then you, know, you, you just shouldn't worry about anything else. And the last one, of course, is that as soon as you do everything else, you should be able to know how your users engage with your product, what is the experience they're having, and how often they, they engage back. So, <coughs> To boil it down, there is no secret sauce. There is really no secret sauce. All, it's all about understanding the context of your product and delivering core product value as often and as fast as possible. And you do that most of the time by evaluating different strategies. So you try some things, you test some things, you evaluate these things, and you move on. So I want to talk also very briefly about complexity because the advice that I gave to junior game designers when I was back uh, a game design manager, the most frequent advice I gave them was because, simply because you can define the variables of a closed system. And most games are semi-closed systems. That doesn't mean you can control user behavior. It's, it's this fallacy that, you know, because you can control the environment and all the variables in the environment, you can really drive and make your users do things, you know, they don't really want to do. And that's never true. From my experience, I have never seen any kind of user do something that they really didn't want to do simply because you control the experience. Uh, and, and, and usually I say that, and it may sound very obvious, is that very often what happens is you go ahead to build something and you have your strategy goals, you have your company goals, you, you, know, you have thought of it all, and then you really disregard it and you have no idea what the user goals are. And then by the time you figure out, okay, we need to convince these people to do all the things we want them to do, complexity starts arising, and then you, things get more and more complex. So whenever I'm faced with a product and then I realize that you know, there's all these edge cases and corners cases that uh, things are you know, very different for different users, then it, usually it means that actually they went the other way around. So they didn't start with user goals and build a product, they had like some company goals, and then they're trying to figure out how they're gonna force their users to do what they want. And as I said, you can induce some unnatural user behavior against the wood. Like it's it's really really uh, impossible to do so. And and, and and the reason I'm saying it, uh, wh why you know it, it's it's so important is because you need to simplify. And you need to simplify not only your product but you also as a growth hacker you need to simplify your analysis. It's it's great that most growth hackers are really brilliant minds and they're very very clever. Uh, and surely uh, you know they're statistical geniuses. Most of us, at least, uh, I think, but but uh, you know, but it doesn't, but it doesn't make any sense to me to go, you know, and say to someone, you know, like and see a huge cross correlation between event, whatever, and user acquisition from that sample. You know, it may make sense to some people, but it won't make sense to most. So that's why I want to talk lastly about communication. And for me, communicating effectively growth strategies and growth is almost as important as actually facilitating and executing. Because at the end of the day, it's not really about the growth hacker, uh, as, as Morgan said. You know, it, sometimes there is this also misconception about growth hacking that all growth hackers are exceptionally uh, persistent and very, uh, how do you say, over uh, qualified, or not, or not overly qualified, overly ambitious individuals that they will stop at nothing. They're overachievers, right? Uh, and, and usually what I found with working with some of these people is that Actually, overachievers don't make great growth hackers because they focus on the goal and they, you know, they set one key metric and they just follow that key metric, even without asking why they follow that key metric. You know, and, and you have to be a little bit more uh, curious and a little bit more at communicating your growth strategy. So, what I'm trying to say is that it's not really an, an issue of one expert. Don't think that just because you hire like you know uh, a data scientist or a growth hacker, you're just suddenly going to have growth. You know, you have to be able to communicate the growth strategies and think about it like in these keystone moments like Twitter and 
Facebook and LinkedIn when they all talked about like you know the corner stone case for us was when we finally found out that you know 10 user, 10 friends in 10 days makes a difference or you know uh, seven followers in 10 days makes a difference if you can boil down your growth strategy in something so simple that can be communicated to everyone within your organization it's then when actually things happening because Really, for me, growth hacking is not this mystical art that is practiced by some kind of ex-marketing geniuses that they know how to increase the metric X and, you know, but it's, it's about being able to communicate your, uh, your growth strategy to everyone so that everyone understands from community management all the way to, you know, product management, to UX people, to your developers, or to the board, to the management. Everyone should be able to understand what is the growth strategy because it's not this one single story that is going to make everything grow exponentially over you know the next month. It's a clear growth strategy distributed in an entire organization that everyone is going to contribute with a little bit. So you have to be able to resonate with how everyone's work can actually uh, be relevant to that growth strategy. And to close it all, I want to talk about how you make it happen because you know. You might get all this, but you, you, if you miss that part, then you're completely screwed. Because I talk very often to organizations and they ask, okay, how do we make that happen? And it's very relevant lately because, you know, everyone wants to hire and grow their growth teams, etc., etc. And you can't really do it without this. So first of all, you have to allow your growth hackers to take ownership. It's impossible to change and improve anything if you don't have ownership over it. It's like, things can change if I don't have ownership to change it. Uh, and, and it might sound again very simple, but it's like uh, it's unbelievable how often uh, organizations fail to realize that. And the second one is freedom, and more importantly, is freedom of failure. Because, <coughs> frankly, you know most of most things fail, right? And you have to know how does your organization and you yourself deal with failure. How, is something is failure acceptable? Do you do, does your organi organization allow? nine out of ten experiments to fail and, and at the end of the day you know do you ask yourself what did we achieve today or what did we learn today how do you reward curiosity over achievement and of course you know don't take me wrong it, it takes a lot of work it's really 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 hard work to, to make it all and and you have to be very persistent the, the, i usually say that most uh, you know product managers and, and growth should be extremely pessimistic people they have to and nothing is ever good enough if you think like yeah that's great that's probably not a very good uh, uh, trait for, uh, for a growth hacker. And finally, okay, that's wrong, uh, is that you need to have integrity. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if anyone has ever designed from one simple feature or is in the business of growth hacking, you know you have, you know, you, everyone is affected by their own bias. I have, you know, I have sit there in front of Mixpan and I looked at the metrics and I was like, yeah, it's going to change, it's going to change. Because, of course, you have your own bias and nobody likes to be, uh, you know, falsified, to, to be wrong, right? So you have to, to have very high integrity to acknowledge that, you know, this doesn't work and move on. And, of course, you know, to, to make it all happen again, as I said, like, you know, you have to understand that it's all about understanding. It's not about knowing. And with that, I think I am within my time. So that's all I have to say.